May the Lord be with you. Good morning. Welcome. It is a joy to see you. We are so grateful that you are in this place. We hope that you sense God's welcome to you. Certainly hope that you feel that in this room. And if you join us online, know that we embrace you as well. And we certainly welcome any who may be newer to our congregation. We're so grateful that you are here and trust that all of us have experienced already the hospitality of this congregation which is but an approximation of the wide open embrace and affirmation of God for each and every one of us. As we worship together this day, we come together amidst the great joy and enthusiasm of Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the start of this holiest of weeks that lead us along the way that Jesus walks ultimately to His cross, His suffering, His death, and His resurrection. But Palm Sunday is not only a celebration, It is not only a day where we shout out glory, laud, and honor to the one who has come into our midst. It is also a day that provides us with contrasts and gives us opportunities to choose which way we will walk. As the minister and writer Benjamin Kramer has said, we want the conquering war horse, and yet Jesus chooses a donkey. We want to take up arms and yet Jesus takes up a cross. We want the empire, and yet Jesus brings the kingdom, the realm, the kinship of those who follow in the way of Christ. And so we have the opportunity to choose this day. We have the opportunity to situate ourselves. We have the opportunity to follow still this way of the cross. And so let us do that as we worship together this Palm Sunday, following Jesus not only amidst the parade, but in all that is ahead as well. As we do that, we stand in a moment to share in a call to worship, and that would be a great chance for any who want to join the processional, any of our children or youth that are young at heart who want to join the processional can make their way to the back and be a part of the parade of palms that will occur during our opening hymn. But now, as you are comfortable and able, we'll begin our worship service by joining together in our call to worship. We come to prepare for the holiest of weeks. Jesus leads us through this week, and we will follow, for he is the life we long for. He is the word who sustains us. Setting aside all power, glory, and might, he comes, modeling humility and obedience for all of us. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who brings us the kingdom of God.
We continue in our worship this morning. We invite you to greet those around you with the peace of Christ, saying, May the peace of Christ be with you. Good morning, everyone. It is so great to worship with you today. Whether you're here in this room or worshiping with us online, we are grateful for you and all that you mean to this community. If you're a guest with us today, we extend an additional welcome. We hope you're experience, you've experienced the life and spirit of this community. If you would, take a moment to fill out the connection card in the pew rack in front of you. Uh, that'll give us a chance uh, to get to know you a little better and help you plug in. You can place this in the offering plate as it goes around later in the service. If you're joining us online, you can find the connection card on our website at fbcgso.org slash connect. And now I'd like to draw your attention to the connections pages in the back of your bulletin. You'll see a lot of things there, including some important Holy Week opportunities for you. There is no midweek this Wednesday, but do make plans to join us Thursday for Monday Thursday meal, communion, and service of shadows. You can sign up for the meal by tomorrow and join us Thursday for a meaningful dinner and worship experience. Then on Good Friday, we have a special opportunity for you to come by uh, into this holy space to experience the Stations of the Cross as they are depicted in the paintings that surround us. The church will be open from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Friday, and there will be music to accompany you as you journey through. And right over here, you can pick up one of these booklets that will help guide your meditation. And of course, we would love to see all of you back here next Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection on Easter Sunday. It will be a Sunday of joy and color and life. Our cross will be beautifully flowered and we will be reminded that we are Easter people. Easter Sunday is also the perfect Sunday to consider becoming a member of this community. We have a variety of ways that you can join. And if you have questions, feel free to ask Alan or any of our ministers after worship. 
Your bulletin is full of announcements and reminders. I encourage you to pay attention to those, especially the one about Trivia Night. Trivia Night is just two weeks away, so sign up your team now. Details for that event are printed in your bulletin. And now as we continue in worship, I'd like to invite all of our children to come down front for children's time with Pastor Amy. Good morning, my friends. You may have noticed we started worship a little differently today. What did we do? Yes. We were walking down and waving our palms. And why did we walk down and wave our palms together? Yes. Because we put it under the cross. We put it under the cross. That's right, as we walked in. Yes. Anybody else? Emerson? That's exactly right, Emerson, that today is the day that we remember when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. He's been on this long journey going toward Jerusalem, and today, finally, he has gotten there. It's a little bit like a parade. Um, this year, I got to go to the Greensboro Christmas Parade for the very first time. Who goes to the Greensboro Christmas Parade? Me. Um, yeah, and when you go to the parade, do you feel excited? <laughs> yeah, you feel happy, especially when that candy starts coming your way, or when the a and band comes down the road. I was so excited. But do you know what? In this parade, when Jesus came into Jerusalem, people were so excited, and then as the week went on, their feelings began to change and change very quickly. Does anyone know why people's feelings began to change through this holiest of weeks? Not worried anymore about it because Jesus is there. That's a, I really like that B. And one reason they changed is because there were people who, um, yes. Um, yeah, Miss Amelia will take you. She can take you. Um, and so as they were coming in, Jesus had this message about everyone being loved. And do you know what? That sounds like good news, right? It did not sound like good news to everybody. The religious leaders and the Roman government did not like Jesus' message. So all these people who were excited on this day when they came in, they started to get scared because the people in charge started telling them that this message was no good, and that Jesus was no good. But do you know what Jesus did? Jesus stayed true. Jesus kept saying the same message no matter what, no matter what people said about him, no matter whether they were cheering him down the road or mocking him later in the week, he stayed true. And that's one of the reasons that we can trust Jesus, because no matter what, he is telling us the same exact thing, that we are all loved just the same. All right? So I hope this week, one, I hope that you got your Holy Week to-go bags. Um, last week, if you didn't, find me after worship, and we will um, get you one. We have a few extra. And I hope that you will take this journey with Jesus and with your family this week so we make it to the great celebration that is Easter next Sunday. All right, that's right, I know. <laughs> All right, let's say our echo prayer together and invite our adults to join us. Dear God, Dear God thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. 
and for his willingness to endure the hard things so that everyone will know that they are loved unconditionally. Help us love like Jesus. Amen. All right, first grade and under can head to junior church with Mr. Jackson. As we join our hearts together in prayer today, I would let you know of several specific prayer needs that we are paying particular attention to this morning. This week, we continue to hold Danielle Delgado in our prayers. Danielle has been at Duke for several weeks now and had a setback earlier this week. Thankfully, she is making improvements and has been recently moved to a step-down room. We pray that things continue to hold steady for her and that she will be able to return home soon. And of course, we invite you all to continue to hold Danielle and her parents, Marie and Carlos, in your prayers. We have several among us who are grieving today. Today, we remember Marietta, Marietta Knoll, and her family in the death of Marietta's brother, Macon Short, just yesterday. We are praying for you, Marietta. And today, you see a luminary in place to remember the remarkable life of Gladys Burroughs. We are holding her daughter, Elaine McRae, in our prayers, and we celebrate the 101 years of faithful life that Gladys lived. She was a gift to each community in which she lived and participated, and she was particularly a gift to First Baptist Church, leading the way in helping First Baptist be the church that it is today. What an honor it was to call Gladys one of our own. Plans have been made for a memorial service here at First Baptist on Monday, April 8th at noon, and you are, of course, invited to join us that day to celebrate her life. And finally, we celebrate this morning. We are excited for Amelia Britt and Jackson Spencer, who just went to lead our children this morning as they were recently engaged. I know you'll want to congratulate them if you've not already gotten the chance to do that. This week, I do invite you to go over the covenant of concerns that can be found on our church website, fbcgso.org slash prayer list, and see those who you might pray for an offer for those who are suffering, for those whom we celebrate, and for all who are not listed as well. Join me in holding those close in your prayers throughout the week to come. And now as we move toward a time of corporate prayer, we are drawing not just our hearts, but our bodies toward the cross. Just as Jesus set his path toward Jerusalem, we set our souls toward the journey to the cross. And so now we're invited to move as you are able toward the center of the room, toward the cross. And you can simply turn your gaze where you are, but if you are able, we invite you to move into the aisles closer and closer to the cross. And we invite you to take your bulletin with you as we sing together.
We do not come to the cross alone, but we do so in the community of believers. As we share in prayer together, I invite you to extend a hand out to a neighbor. Reach out to touch someone close by and remember that we offer our prayers to God, not just as individuals, but in relationship to one another as God has created us to be. Please pray with me. Oh Lord, on this day of celebration, we thank you for what you showed us through the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. Instead of a king on a war horse, you showed us a humble man on a donkey. Instead of a crowd of political and social influencers, you showed us common people who responded to your message of love and hope. On this joyful day, remind us of our role in the Palm Sunday story. Remind us to look not to the powers of this world, but to the message of compassion and humility that comes in the person of Jesus Christ. Remind us that we must also lay our cloaks down, not for those who are impressive and powerful, but for those who are in need. O oh God, as this week begins with triumph, let us not forget all that it is to follow in the story of Jesus, that even in his last days, he turned over the tables of injustice in the temple. He brought his disciples into eternal relationship with him. He forgave the ultimate betrayal he would experience. He cried out to God in his darkest hour. We desire that our own days seek to emulate those last days of Christ. Equip us, O oh God, to seek justice, unconditional love, and forgiveness through deepening our relationship with you. Today we sing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. May our own paths lead us in your ways. May we enter every space in your name. May our lives sing out praises of Hosanna to Jesus Christ today and every day. And it is in his holy name that we pray. Amen. Our gospel lesson this Palm Sunday comes from Mark, the 11th chapter, the first 11 verses, recounting Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. I invite you to listen for God's word. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage in Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it to me. If anyone says, why are you doing this? Just say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. 
They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, Why are you doing this, untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw cloaks on it and sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks along the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who were followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord.
We are grateful to our choir and our musicians this day. These gifts of music and offerings to God are certainly part of how we have encountered God in this place already, and we continue to listen for God's voice as we come now to a moment of preaching. And as we gather around the scripture text and the moment of this Palm Sunday, I would invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Oh God, in so many ways you have come near us once again. In so many ways, through this community, through this service of worship, through the gifts that we share in this place, we ask that you would stay near us now, that you would help us to encounter you once again through your word and through the living word, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I've been asked the question a few times in my life, and maybe you have too. Do you want to be saved? I was in high school when some friends and I decided to catch a showing of a summer blockbuster. And amidst the crowd in the theater was a young guy who leaned forward over the seats and out of the blue just asked, excuse me, fellas, don't mean to bother you, but I was wondering, are y'all Christians? And if not, do you want to get saved? Now, I was just trying to watch a movie on a Friday night which is what I was planning to explain to this new acquaintance, but then the preview started and I was, in a way, saved. That is, I was spared from more of this awkward interaction with this movie theater evangelist as he slid back down to his seat. But it's happened to me at least a few times in my adult life, too. Maybe to you as well. A zealous, passionate adherent of the faith will stop you. Like once in college in Florida when I was walking on the beach in the middle of one church's beach evangelism blitz. Or almost weekly in the subway tunnels when we lived in New York City where there's no shortage of people wanting to pass out pamphlets telling you what your final stop could be. Or once in an airport, do you want to get saved, the person next to me asked. And I explained I was a minister. And then after a pause, well, do you want to get saved? (laughs) Saved. It's tough for me to separate the word from some of its clumsy and aggressive uses, you know? Now, of course, we of Christian faith, we believe in salvation. We believe in the resurrection of our lives through the love of God in Christ. We proclaim this, we sing this out, we teach it to our children, we embody it in baptism, and we seek to live it out and project it with our lives in this world. And we can read as well as any other Christian what Jesus says to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be what? Saved through him. Still, the word itself, the concept, seems to have been largely interpreted and claimed by a certain narrow segment of Christianity. Often those who understand salvation as personal, with little implication for the systems and structures of the world. The focus here is on the eternal, the heavenly reality, often with little bearing on the here and now. And so in light of this, we can grant some discomfort or dis-ease with the word, and we can understand how sometimes it's exchanged for other words in our theological reflections, and even in our scripture, words that might capture the work of Christ, like transformed or redeemed or renewed, something other than that word saved, and yet here it comes right in the center of today's reading. Then those who went ahead and those who followed, they were shouting, Hosanna, Mark says. And you wave enough palm branches in church And the meaning of this gets lost somewhere. This is not simply praise. This is not simply jubilant adoration. This is not glory, laud, and honor only. No, if you translate Hosanna, it means literally, save us. In fact, it means it even more urgently. Save us now. And upon further consideration... This word does show up throughout the Gospels, saved, like when a woman with a hemorrhage comes up in the crowd and she says as she presses forward, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made well, is what the translation is in most of our Bibles, but that's not really what she said. She said, I will be saved. It's a Greek word, sozo, that literally means saved. 
because this is not merely a woman with a physical hemorrhage that needs to be cured. She's isolated from her family. She's on the outskirts of her community. She has no place to worship until she is saved. She's like that man whom we meet later in the Gospels who lived out among the tombs of Gerasa. This was a man possessed by demons, you might remember. He was kept under guard so that he wouldn't be a threat to anyone else, so disturbed he had become. But then Jesus crosses into that territory and into this man's life, and Jesus cries out for the demons to leave this man. And the people who saw it, they talked about how this demon-possessed man had been healed, our translations say. But that's not the word. The word is saved because he was shackled. He was living amidst tombs. And Jesus proclaims his release from all that. He lets him return to his home. Was this man healed or was it something more than that? It was a tax collector, a rich man, Zacchaeus. And Jesus calls him out of the tree and he enters his house for lunch to all of the questions of those all around. And we don't know what was said at the table, but when the meal was over, the man emerged to say, I'm giving half of what I have to the poor. And if I've ever defrauded anyone, I'm going to restore it 400%. You know what Jesus says? Jesus says, salvation has come to this house. Or in other words, this is someone who has been saved because he's been freed. He's loosed from his pursuit of his money and his belief that life is a zero-sum game. He's no longer going door to door trying to collect meaning, but instead discovering the great truth of the gospel, that life is found by offering it. That's someone who was saved. And there was a blind beggar near Jericho. Bartimaeus his name. And he was sitting where he always sat. In fact, in the Gospel of Mark, this is the story that comes right before the events described in our passage today as Jesus and his followers come by him on the way to Jerusalem and the parade had always passed Bartimaeus by. And so this story contrasts this throng of disciples who are happy and enthusiastic and shouting and preparing to wave their palms and they're just breezing by this man who can't see any of it as he depends on the pity of others around him. Jesus, have mercy on me, he yet shouts out. He was hushed by those around. Quiet. Nobody wants to hear from you, Bartimaeus. But then Jesus heard and Jesus said, what do you want? And the man says, let me see, to which Jesus says, your faith has made you well. That's how the story goes. But then you know, that's not what was said. Because here is a man cast off on the roadside. And within a few moments, Mark says he has joined Jesus along the way, all the way into Jerusalem where his voice combines with others to shout out Hosanna and where he knows more than most what that really means. Transformed, renewed, redeemed, and cured, and made well, and healed, we can call it whatever seems most comfortable. But sometimes Jesus really does save a person. And Hosanna might just be one of the most important words in all of the New Testament. It might just form the sub substance of Jesus' life and ministry. In fact, we see it at the very beginning as the angel announces to Joseph, Mary will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus because he will save people. And so he rides into Jerusalem to do just that. Surrounded by this throng of people who say that's what they want. Save us, Jesus. Save us now. And how we shout right along because some of us know what it is to sit in the same spot again and again as life just seems to pass us by. And others of us know what it is to go through the monotony of our lives searching for some kind of meaning. And some of us are longing for a touch or a connection that might help us feel whole in a new way. And some of us might even feel overwhelmed by new challenges, might feel far from the work of God in this world, might feel out on the edges somewhere, trapped, or at least crying out, have mercy, have mercy, oh God. And so we shout out in the city, save us, and shouting right along is a man once blind who got swept up into the crowd, and a man who had been possessed but found his life restored, and a woman who had found her issue of blood no longer an obstacle to belonging, and a former tax collector turned benefactor 
And how many more who had known this transformative, saving love of God through Jesus? Save us, the people shout. But if we're going to shout this out with them, we have to be prepared for just what this kind of salvation means, what it asks of us. We have to be prepared for the fact that Jesus doesn't save us in the ways that we want so much as in the ways that we truly need. William Stringfellow, the noted theologian, used to say that Christians go to church on Palm Sunday because we love a parade. And he's articulating the reality that Palm Sunday can become too sentimental. It can become maybe even too uncompromisingly joyful. In fact, some theologians and church leaders have even asked if we should alter Palm Sunday. And recently, many churches have augmented it by adding a Passion Sunday, where the entire narrative of Jesus' suffering is read right along with the celebration of palms because so often we are tempted to skip from the upbeat parade and the songs of Palm Sunday to the hopeful resurrection in volume and flowers of Easter, and we forget all that happens in between. And we pass over all of the struggle and the grief and the hopeless moments. We skip right by the moments of choosing who we are and what we believe and how these are part of salvation and resurrection too. As we follow Jesus from these shouts in the city, we will come to learn that Jesus' efforts to save us, they are not instantaneous. They don't free us from burden always. They also impose things on us. They call us to change in certain ways. They ask us to set down more than our cloaks or the palms that we've cut but also to let go of and to put down all that we wrap around ourselves in protection, all that we use as refuge and barrier. They call us to give up our own way, our very lives, to take up the way of Jesus. They are not marked by triumph, in fact, but by vulnerability and self-giving love and humility. Go find a donkey, Jesus says at the start of this passage, and if anyone asks why you need the colt, just say that the Lord needs it. The Lord needs a donkey. What sort of Lord is this? They must have wondered. We still wonder it today. As he again and again just defies our expectations. The American jazz musician, the great Gregory Porter, expresses this beautifully in his song entitled, Take Me to the Alley. And the lyrics are as follows. Will they gild their houses in preparation for the king? They line the sidewalks with every sort of shiny thing. But they will be surprised when they hear him say, Take me to the alley. Take me to the afflicted ones. Take me to the lonely ones that somehow lost their way. Let them hear me say, I am your friend. Come to my table. Rest here in my garden. You will have a pardon. You will have a pardon. Take me, Jesus says, out of these streets and to the places that are low and humble. And he says this to all of the people who are expecting the triumph and the might of an entering Messiah. This is a contrast that plays out on the streets of Jerusalem that very day. The biblical scholars Marcus Borg and John Dominique Crossan have written a book on the last week of Jesus' life, and it reminds that this day is also the start of Passover, the time when Rome knew that the crowds would swell and that the control needed to increase too. And so the Roman governor himself, Pontius Pilate, would move his headquarters in Caesarea to Jerusalem. Inciting this entry of Pilate into the city, Crossan and Borg imagined that there were two parades that day. Jesus coming from Bethany into Jerusalem from the east, while from the west, the Roman governor Pilate entered with all of the pomp of state power, two parades. And there's this one with the conquering war horse, and there is one with the borrowed donkey from the outskirts of Bethany. There's one that's a show of military might and power and glory, while there is another that proclaims a whole other way. There's one that celebrates empire, 
And then there's one that points beyond itself to what its leader had called the kingdom of God. And from that road with palms, Jesus then will move to the temple and he'll turn over the tables. He'll reorient the systems that it held to that moment. And then later, gathering with his disciples, he will model a power that comes through service. He'll talk about finding your life by giving it away. He'll kneel, he'll wash their feet, and he'll share his last word and enduring charge. Love one another in this way that I have modeled for you. And from the supper to the garden, crying out in anguish, even in some self-doubt. And from the garden to the conflict and the guards and the trial and the mockery. And then another parade that will lead to his death and to the stone and to the silence. The Gospel of Luke says that Jesus was killed for three reasons. We found this fellow subverting the nation opposing payment of taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king, they say. In John's gospel, the angry mob warns Pilate, if you let this man go, well, then you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. People today argue about who's subverting our nation. But I don't know that I've heard anyone say what Luke says, that Jesus is subverting our nation. That is that Jesus may just be subverting us, turning things over, reorienting our lives, calling us still to another way. And in these ways, truly trying to save us. Well, the crowd with their palms and their pastels, they shouted out, Hosanna, save us now. But then all throughout the week, what happens? They begin to peel off. And they begin to say even more loudly with their lives otherwise. There's Judas and his plans, and there's the disciples, and they're sleeping, and there's Peter, and all of his denial and self-preservation. There's Thomas and all of his forgetfulness and doubts about what happens next, they wanted to be saved until they learned what it asked of them. And they watch him on the cross, and then some of them will cry out, Save yourself! But that's not why he came. That's not why he came to this earth. This is not why he entered into Jerusalem, and it's not why he processes into the center of our lives this day. He came not for self-preservation, but for the commitment and the call to another way, a way that is much more than any sort of quick spiritual formula, but a way of love that really can save the world. It was announced at the start of his life and is now brought to the city and offered to each of us. Will we receive it? Will we give our lives to it? This is the question of Holy Week, friends. What if the welcome parade of children in palms turns out to be a protest, a a counter movement to the way things are? What if the one we follow starts turning over tables and rearranging our settled patterns and calling us towards something different, something more? What if he looks us in the eyes and calls us to love as I have loved you? What if he leaves the garden at the hands of a dangerous mob? What if he puts us in a place of vulnerability outside of his trial? What if all of this calls us to come close to suffering and death and to really see it? And what will we do? How far will we follow? Hosanna, we shout. Palms in our clutches. But as this story continues all the way of this week, Jesus will ask us another question in one way or another. It's one you've probably heard at some point in your life, and maybe you can hear it right now. Do you want to be saved? Amen.
We come now to respond to the gospel. Thank you, Eric. My fault. Um, And as we do, we come to a hymn that is a hymn that invites us to respond. A hymn that invites our commitment. Our commitment to live out what we have said, what we have shouted and sung this day. That, oh God, through Christ, we want to know this way of salvation. As we all commit ourselves to this in our various ways. You might have a commitment today that's public. Maybe you want to join this church and become a member. You want to profess something about your own journey of faith. One of the ways we do that in this church is that I will stand down front and would love to receive you with the open arms of this congregation if you have a response that is public today. But be assured, all of us are responding. All of us are committing ourselves again to this way that Jesus has made known to us as we stand and we sing together this hymn of commitment. morning. As we come to this time of offering, a quick reminder that guests can be placed in the offering plate or made online. And if you are a guest with us, a reminder that there are connection cards available in the pews that can be filled out and placed in the offering plate as it is passed. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, 
as we enter this holy week, let us remember and appreciate the sacrifice to come. Help us be grateful for your grace and your love for us, which we could never earn. Help us to keep our focus on the hope that your sacrifice provides for all of us. In your holy name we pray, amen.
Our thanks again to all who have led us so beautifully this day, our choir and our music leadership, our friends in the brass. Thank you so much for being with us and for offering wonderful gifts to our worship this day as we enter into this holy week. We thank all of you for being a part of this community of love and hope together. Um, As we go from this time, our worship continues in multiple ways, but one way is to continue to share together in fellowship and in community, and we will do that this morning on the front lawn where we have a reception prepared, and we'd love for you to stick around. This is that time of year where the weather allows us to enjoy the beauty of the grounds, and we gather after worship outside, and we hope that you will plan to do that this day. It's a little bit colder than we might have thought when we scheduled this, but uh, you have a coat, and you can stick around and find some sunshine, uh, and we would love to have the chance to gather together outside. And then, of course, remember all the ways that we have uh, an opportunity to follow Jesus, not only into the city, but into what is ahead. Um, One way that has been occurring over the course of the weekend and continues tomorrow is wonderful volunteers from our church who have worked with our friends at Community Housing Solutions as part of a ramp building project for one of our neighbors in need. Tomorrow our youth will take up a project that was started by several in our church, many in our church over the weekend, and so our our blessings with them as they respond um, to God's love through service uh, tomorrow. Then, of course, remember Maundy Thursday and the unique meal reservation you can make if you'd like a meal as a part of that service. We'd love to see you for that reflective service. And then here again, uh, 11 to 1 o'clock, a time of self-guided meditation on Good Friday. Notably at noon, uh, we will be um, blessed by the music of Rebecca Carlson, our uh, new member and violinist in our church, will be offering one of Heinrich Bieber's mystery sonatas, which were inspired by the Stations of the Cross. And so if you time your reflection to right around noon, uh, that is what uh, I would recommend. But you can come anytime between 11 o'clock and 1. And then, of course, next Sunday, Easter Sunday, we are back together as with the instrument of death becomes a symbol of new life and hope, and all of us are wrapped up in that. As Chris mentioned, next Sunday is also a date we have marked as a joining Sunday, and if you're interested in being a member of First Baptist and want to do that as part of a larger group, uh, know that we would love to talk more about that. Any of our pastors can tell you more about that opportunity. But now as we go from this place, we go out into this world, and we seek to follow Jesus in all that he is doing throughout this holy week, I would encourage you as you're able to stand for a word of blessing and benediction in our leaving. Friends, go in peace. As you go, it is so important, once again, that you remember who you are, that you are daughters and sons and children beloved of God, and that you are friends and companions of Jesus our Christ, and that through the power of the Spirit, the love of Christ is at loose in this world, and it is so through your very lives. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.